One, two, one, two, three, four. Hey, hey, it's Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, where we foster innovation and enthusiasm in the ranching industry through sharing the stories and practices of different ranchers and beef industry leaders. Be sure to be a greater part of this podcast and become involved on my social media pages. Follow Cattle Convos on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, or Shay Keister on LinkedIn. To join the conversations around the challenges we face as ranchers and how we can overcome them. You can also find more information about this podcast, all my episodes, and how to partner with me on this show by going to my website, casualcattleconversations.com. With that, thanks for tuning in, and let's see who our guest is today. Hey folks, just a quick second. Is your ranch not getting enough moisture to feed your herd? My friend Jess at Red Summit Advisors understands how hard it can be on your operation during the dry years. Pasture, rangeland, and forage insurance may be just what you need. Jess can help you with this USDA program to protect your ranch when there isn't enough rain. Not every ranch is the same, so she looks at the historical rainfall data in your area and focuses coverage on the driest months. So, you can be happy when it rains, covered when it doesn't, and make sure your family can stay on the land for generations to come. The deadline for 2022 coverage is December 1st, so give Jess a call at 801-360-6431 for an analysis on your place. To learn more, check out redsummit.com. That's red with two Ds. So R E D D S U M M I T dot com or call Jess at eight zero one three six zero six four three one. So to start off, would you please explain your background in the ranching industry? Sure. Uh, I grew up probably about 50 miles from where you grew up, just in a different era. Um, So grew up on a cow-calf operation in South Central North Dakota, just south of Bismarck, um, and was very involved in the day-to-day activities there all the way through college. Um, Got my undergraduate degree at North Dakota State University, and then kind of switched and went to the other end of the industry and and focused on the feedlot industry. Did a feedlot management internship program here at the University of Nebraska, um, both a master's and PhD at University of Nebraska, I spent six years in the Texas A&M system, um, and then I've been back on faculty at UNL uh, since 2012. Okay, so you're on faculty at UNL, but what is your position there? What do you kind of do today? Yeah, so my job title is Beef Cattle Production Systems, which I always say is the best job title in the world because I can do anything I want as long as it's related to beef cattle and I call it a system, okay? What that means functionally is if you think about the segments of the industry, so cow-calf, post weaning, and then feedlot, and then the end product, um, I'm usually trying to tie together two or more of those segments, right? So um, we start with a weaned calf, you know, what is the optimal rate of gain that you want that weaned calf? And what are the consequences when they go into the feedlot? And even, you know, what are the what what does that do to marbling potential? Those types of things. Um, so I span everything from from cow calf production um, all the way through the feedlot in my research program. Well, awesome! That's a pretty neat job title, or you have a lot of flexibility there. So that's pretty neat. So today, I really kind of wanted to talk about grazing corn stock. So what are your experiences, you know, maybe on the research side, but specifically with helping ranchers in this area? Yeah, so um, it, when I started at UNL, well, first of all, grazing corn stocks is not new, right? I mean, we've been doing that for generations. Um, but as, as we've become more specialized, and especially, um, you know, we're a couple generations in where the integrated farm 
is kind of a thing of the past and and people have generally specialized and you know they're either farmers or they're ranchers some people are ranchers that farm to feed cattle and you know some people are farmers that have cattle around to eat extra feed right so you, you kind of most people fall into one of those two categories um so you know as the as yields have increased um and the intensity of production has increased on on farming acres and quite frankly as we've had more grasslands converted um, into cropping acres you know that opens up a lot of questions about how do those two things go together right so from the farming perspective what am i giving up um, if i allow cows to graze my cornfield and um, i would say the old I'm going to call it a paradigm, but the old strategies of grazing corn residue, um, you know, is is perhaps not relevant today. Um, you know, it, in when I was young, um, certainly there was a lot of concern about corn left in the field. We don't, unless unless you have a young or inexperienced grain cart driver that spills, um, we don't really worry about residual corn because the harvesting you know, combines are just so efficient now that, that there's very little grain left in a cornfield. So there's been some changes over time, but it, it's not a new concept. Um, but I would say, you know, the biggest thing that we've done is try to reconcile um, that tug of war um, between the cropping systems and the, and the cattle systems. Okay. So like with your job position, how are you um, directly involved in this? process right. so that's working with ranchers or farmers or how are you involved in that process so um primarily from a research standpoint okay so we generate the data that then can help answer questions by producers um, i don't personally have an extension appointment so producers don't see me out at, at meetings and those types of things because that's not in my job description um, i'm a, a researching i have a research and teaching appointment which keeps me on campus uh, most of the time. But I uh, work very closely with Extension, um, have a colleague by the name of Mary Junowski, um, who, who does a fabulous job on the Extension side, really taking the research that she and I do together uh, most of the time and extending that to producers so that they have the answers that they're looking for. Okay, so going back to grazing corn stalks as this feed resource, so can you talk a little bit about the nutritional value of um, grazing corn stalks? Sure. Um, so let me start, you have to start with the plant, okay? Um, there's about 50% of the plant is grain by weight, actually just a little more than that, and about 50% is forage. The forage that's in the corn plant when it's harvested varies dramatically. Okay, so you don't you won't see um, a cow out consuming the stem of a corn stalk unless she's really really hungry. So the nutritional value of the stem is it's not quite zero, but it's close to zero. On the other extreme, um, the husk that surrounds the corn cob, right? Mm -hmm. That's got a, a digestibility that can approach 70%. So you're talking about digestibility of very lush spring grass. Okay, so it's it's very different. Um, and the cow is, is very good at selecting those best parts. So the best parts of the corn plant are the husk and the leaf. And so that's, if there's any corn out there, she'll find that, especially an experienced cow. Um, but then they'll consume the husk and the leaf. And we don't recommend that you ask them to consume the stem. What you need to remember is that grazing corn residue is very different than baling and harvesting corn stalks because the cow is able to select for the husk and the leaf in the field. And if you've baled it all and you're forcing her to eat it, now you're forcing her to eat some stem, okay? So the nutritional value, back to your original question, um, the nutritional value that we put on from an energetic assumption standpoint is we use about a 55% TDN for cows grazing corn, corn residue. If you bale corn residue and you put it in a bale feeder um, or you know, force them to eat it somehow, we use a 43. And really 
And so nutritionally, the difference between a, a 55 TDN and a 43 TDN diet is huge, okay? But the reason that those two things are so different is because the stem is, is really lowly digestible compared to the rest of the plant. Okay, so you've talked about these nutritional differences. So when they're grazing corn stalks, what needs to be supplemented with that, you know, mineral wise or other feed source wise? Yeah, um, it's an excellent question and, and probably um, maybe one of the most misunderstood or a, if we, have, we have trouble getting producers to believe us when we say that a um, non-lactating, so the calf's been weaned, gestating pregnant cow does not need any additional protein or energy supplement when she's grazing corn residue. And when people first hear that, you know, you look at the residue and it's brown and you think it's low, low quality feed, they've got to need something, right? But we have a lot of data on that class of animal, okay? So she's not, she doesn't have a calf on her side, she's not lactating, and she's already pregnant. That is the lowest of her annual nutrient requirement. That time is her lowest requirement in terms of nutrient requirements throughout her production cycle. Um, and, and she just doesn't need any protein or energy. Now, mineral, vitamin, premix, all of those things that you would provide uh, during the summer, yes, uh, we would recommend that you provide those. Now, there's caveats to that, right? Um, you and I grew up in North Dakota. Uh, grazing corn stalks in North Dakota is... Uh, maybe a little bit more variable uh, mm -hmm. than it is as you move south and, and into, say, for example, southeastern Nebraska, where you can probably get from, uh, you know, November to March and perhaps without any significant weather that would keep her from grazing, right? So, um, and actually the assumption is, or when you go out, if you get a significant snow, um, that that'll inhibit them from grazing and then you need to provide um, some additional protein and energy. Um, snow itself, Cows are pretty good at digging through the snow. Snow itself doesn't really inhibit their grazing too much, but ice will. Uh, so if you have an ice storm, then we need to start thinking about um, providing some additional supplement. Or if you have extremely cold temperatures, um, then for maintenance requirements are gonna go up and, and perhaps need to provide some additional energy and protein. Okay, awesome. So thank you for going through and kind of explaining the nutritional side of it. So as we kind of shift and look at the management end, what would you say the common mistakes our producers make when they're using or grazing corn stalks? Um, I think, I, I don't want to call it a mistake, but I, I think producers tend to think in animals per acre. And what they need to be thinking is animals per bushel. Okay. So remember I said that the corn plant is about 50% forage and 50% grain. Well, if I know what the yield on a field is, I then know what the forage availability is. And so there's a much, it's, it's a very different grazing scenario if you've produced 150 bushel to the acre corn versus 200 or 250 bushel to the acre corn, okay? The easy math in my head is, is 200 bushels to the acre. Um, if you look at the amount of husk and leaf on, um, per bushel of grain produced, um, it's about 16. Okay. So for every bushel of grain, you get about 16 pounds of, uh, husk and leaf, which is primarily what they're going to eat. We've assumed, um, through experience about a 50% grazing efficiency, which is fairly standard. That means you're going to get eight pounds. Um, of grazable forage per bushel of grain produced, okay? So at 200 bushel uh, corn, you're gonna have 1600 pounds of forage available to you. Many producers think on an AUM basis, okay? So how much feed does it require to feed a thousand pound of beef animal um, for a month? And by definition, at least in the Nebraska system, that's 780 pounds of air-dried forage. Okay, so there's a little, um, you know, at 1,600 pounds, there's a little over two AUMs per acre there, right? Versus 
if you had 100 uh, bushels to the acre, you would only have one AUM per acre there, right? So moving away from thinking about, I have X number of acres of corn to thinking about this was my yield on these acres of corn and then back calculating how many AUMs you have available and then either how many cows you can put on or if you have a set number of cows, how long they can graze for. Okay, so how, looking at this as a big picture view, how would you say that grazing corn stalks benefits the rancher if they're able to use this as a feed resource? Because not everyone is able to use it. I think we need to be talking about, as we think um, about communicating with our consumer, um, we need to be talking about multi-use how ruminants and cattle specifically allow us to use more of what we're producing in an efficient manner, okay? From um, the rancher's perspective, how much additional cost is there in grazing the residue? You've already put all of the inputs into the corn. You've already harvested the corn. And so your choice is you can either graze the residue or do nothing with it. It is by far, even if you're paying yourself or you're renting, um, you know, in Nebraska, on the eastern part of the state, we're supply and demand. There's way more supply of corn residue than there are cows to consume it. You know, you're probably talking about eight to ten dollars uh, per acre. If you move west, where the relative concentration of cows goes up and the supply of corn residue goes down, all of those acres are utilized. Maybe you're at twenty-five, twenty, twenty-five dollars per acre, right? There's going to be somebody listening to your podcast that says those numbers aren't right. But in general, um, you know, supply and demand dictates how much you're going to pay either yourself or um, rental rates for corn residue. If you look at the amount of digestible forage, so on a TDN basis, use that 55 TDN times the pounds of forage that are available, corn residue is by far the cheapest feed resource that a rancher will have access to. Okay, now that's without trucking and some of those types of things. But, um, you know, it, it's probably equivalent, you think about just grass hay, you know, you'd probably be, be paying $35 a ton for grass hay to get to be equivalent to most of the economics for corn residue grazing. Okay, that's the number one benefit for that period of time when cows can be out on corn stalks that is your cheapest feed probably in the entire year. From a bigger picture, um, if, if you look at, and this is a little bit further away from, from direct ranching, right? But if you think about resource utilization, increasing global population, um, diminishing actually number of grazing acres and even farming acres as the population increases, we've gotta be more efficient and I'm going to take it one step further. I know greenhouse gas production isn't always popular within the ranching community, but it's something that is on the minds of, of um, the public overall, especially the impacts of beef on um, greenhouse gas emissions, right? So what's the, the environmental footprint? You've already invested all of the energy, gas, carbon and gas emissions, all of those things in the corn crop. Now we've used that to generate beef. I mean, the, the improvement in efficiency from for the entire production system by utilizing that residue um, is huge. Um, so there's a lot of benefits. I'm a big proponent of, of grazing corn residue. Um, we can talk about the, the impacts on yield some if you want to, um, but, but in most systems, there's really no reason not to be utilizing the residue if it's available to you. Well, I really appreciate how you took that. I mean, a lot of times I've always heard this topic, you know, more focused on the economic side for the rancher. Like, and like you talked about, there's a huge impact there, but really looking at, looking at it for our resource management and being able to explain that to consumers, I think that is very important, especially as we look at, a, you know, an industry where we're going in the direction of traceability. Yeah, there... <laughs> So, I mean, we're, we're attempting to, to generate those numbers that people can use to model, right? So we're, we're set, kind of segmenting, out, segmenting the production system and looking at 
um, at least brome grass. That's what we have access to in eastern Nebraska. Um, you know, so summer grazing very traditionally. Um, to be frank, the, the greenhouse gas emissions for corn crop, that's already been established. Um, but what hasn't been established is what are the emissions from cows grazing that corn residue, um, dry lotted cows, cows grazing um, a cover crop. So we're trying to do all of these different segments for the cow, um, for a backgrounded calf, and then in the feedlot, and you can put those together and approximate at least, you know, we, we have approximations for carbon footprint for the beef industry. And those are probably okay. But when you start talking about traceability, you know, how does my system impact that environmental footprint? Um, we're very close to having those numbers where you can change the production system and see how that changes the, the overall outcome in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Well, that sounds like something that'll be a really neat needed resource once it comes out as far as a model standpoint for producers. So as we look at managing cattle on corn stalks, typically, you know, how long can cattle graze corn stalks? I know that might vary between operation, but what are those kind of timelines or when do you need to realize that, hey, it's time to pull them off this field? Right. Um, so as soon as the corn is harvested, right, the, there's a bottleneck there for a lot of producers, especially, I mean, if they own the corn field, they're trying to get harvest done and they're trying to get cows out on, on corn stalks and they've got to get the fencing and the water set. You know, there's a bit of a labor bottleneck um, right away in the fall, but nutritionally or from a management standpoint, you know, as soon as you can get into the field um, after it's been harvested. Um, and then it's really weather dependent. You know, if you have a, a major storm and, and, you know, there's six or eight inches of snow and she can't get out and graze or you have an ice storm. Um, at times, having a management plan where you can either feed or supplement in the field. Um, again, depending on where you are, where you and I grew up, you know, once, once the snow comes, often it's there for the remainder of the winter. That's not necessarily the case um, as you go back further south. So it kind of depends on where you're at um, in terms of weather effects. Um, and then it's really thinking about it in terms of AUMs. Okay, how much forage do I have available to me? And what is my grazing demand on that forage? How many cows do I have and how long? That will dictate how long you can stay in a field. There is some benefit um, to moving from field to field, giving them access to a fresh field. And the reason for that is when she goes in, when a cow, an experienced cow goes into a cornfield, She's going to find any grain that's left there, which is normally very little. Then she's going to eat the husk and then the leaf. So her diet is changing from the first day that she goes into the cornfield until the last day that she comes out of the cornfield, right? So the proportion of grain, husk, leaf, and then cob and stem, which you, you really want to try to avoid. Okay, so if you're moving, for example, from pivot to pivot, you've given her access to fresh husk fresh grain, fresh leaf, right? So there is some advantages to, to moving cows throughout um, that grazing period. One of the questions that we've really taken a hard look at is how long can you graze into the spring? Um, there's kind of an unwritten rule of thumb in Nebraska that you have to have them out by March 15th to get ready for planting and so that they don't compact the soil. Uh, the data do not support that. Okay, so we've grazed well into April. And the idea is, you know, our, our spring grass is gonna be ready the end of April. And we really wanna minimize that gap in between corn stalk grazing and when she can go to grass. Okay, because then you gotta feed supplemental hay and, and you got more expensive feed in there. But um, if it's going to cause damage to the subsequent crop by leaving it, her in there when it's muddy, um, that's a problem from the cropping system's perspective. So we've worked really hard at trying to um, create the worst case scenario. So you take our grazing, our stocking recommendations for, um, for corn residue, we actually doubled that in the spring when it's muddy and tried to beat up experimental fields as badly as we could and then um, we come in with soybeans. Now, soybeans are a fairly robust plant, 
um, but that's a normal cropping system in Nebraska. And, and Shay, we can't find any reduction in yield. There's just no reduction in yield there. Um, we even went so far as to hold cattle out of a field until it rained in the spring. And then we stocked them so heavily, you would think it was like a feedlot pen. Okay, so we put a whole bunch of cattle in for a very short intensive period of time and we still couldn't find a reduction in yield. We get a lot of pushback on that. Um, and, and I mean, we have clay loam soils in this part of the state, right? So as you, as you move west and you get less rainfall and, and sandier soils, okay, I understand there's those differences, but this perception that you have to be off by March 15th, the data just simply do not support. So I don't think there's an end date um, where you have to have the cattle off um, until uh, it's time to go in and plant the next crop in that field. Well, awesome. I appreciate you sharing uh, the typical perspective that this is how we've always done it. This is the unwritten rule as well as the data side of it. So as we look at grazing corn stalks, are there, you know, any toxicity issues, any of those things that producers need to be aware of before their cattle go out there? And how can they make sure that those issues aren't there before they turn cattle out? Yeah, so um, I've never I've never seen a toxicity issue on on corn residue. Um, you know, the two that you might be worried about um, would be mycotoxins in the corn. But if if the corn is harvested and they're not really consuming the cob, probably not going to see that. We do get questions about nitrates, um, but nitrates. Well, for one. Um, you really have to segment. We're talking about a very specific, the, the corn has been harvested and you're grazing the residue, okay? So this is a different scenario than grazing drought stress corn, you know, cane corn that's been drought stressed and didn't make corn. It's a different situation, okay? So most people will fertilize based on an expected yield. And if the, if the crop actually made that yield, then that nitrogen has been utilized and there's really no concerns for nitrates. Even if the crop is, um, had a lower yield, maybe didn't get quite as much rain as what you were expecting, um, and there is some residual nitrogen there, that nitrate accumulation, well, first of all, the plant is dead, right? Um, so its production cycle is, is over. Those nitrates are probably going to senesce out of the plant back into the ground. And if there is any nitrate accumulation that's in the bottom part of the stem, and one thing I hope that I've emphasized is you don't want to meet the stem, right? So there's really no nitrate. I've never seen an issue with nitrates um, in harvested residue, uh, corn residue. Now, let me put a caveat on that because we, we do have some areas especially where you and I are from and, and into the West where there is some drought issues this year. Um, and I've had some questions and tried to help some people on grazing drought stress corn. That's really a different circumstance because now you fertilized based on this expected yield and that yield may actually be zero, right? And that plant may be, instead of knee high by the 4th of July, it may never get more than knee high. Okay, well, there's nitrates accumulating in that plant. They're probably still in the lower part of the stem, um, but we want to we want to approach that with a with a lot more caution. The worst case scenario from a nitrate standpoint is if you have drought stress corn and you swap it and you try to hay it, because now you you have all of that nitrate that's in the stem, and if you go feed those bales to a cow, that nit nitrate's all there. Okay, so when I, I want to I want to be very clear when I say there's really no concerns with nitrate, that is in a very normal year where you had a normal corn crop and there's residue in the field after harvest. Um, that's a very different thing from drought stress corn. Okay, so and you just want to be clear on why we can't feed these nitrates. What's the impact on that pregnant cow through feeding nitrates? Sure. Um, I want to get myself in trouble, but we can actually feed some nitrate, okay? So from the, from the rumen mic microbe standpoint, um, nitrate is a source of nitrogen. And so just like we can feed urea, 
they have the ability to use the that nit nitrogen that's in nitrate. The problem is that the microbes that convert um, it's actually nitrite into ammonia, um, they need time to adapt. And so we can increase the nitrate load slowly and get along okay. The problem is if we do that all in a day, and so we turn cows out onto a high nitrate field or pasture of some kind, the nitrite accumulates and spills over into the blood. Um, and it, it keeps the, the compound is it's conversion of hemoglobin into methemoglobin. I don't want to get into the biochemistry too much, but basically um, hemoglobin can't carry oxygen and they asphyxiate. Um, by the way, it's the same process that turns your, your meat brown um, in the refrigerator or in the shelf. Um, so production of methemoglobin in the blood and, and they they can't carry oxygen and they asphyxiate. Um, there's some indication, I think probably some debate about how much sooner you'll have abortions before the cow actually dies. Um, but I don't want to get into either one of those circumstances. I want to be conservative and stay out of the nitrate situation. Or if I'm forced to use high nitrate plants, like some people, quite frankly, I mean, it, it's that's the feed that they have available to them. Um, then I want to be very careful about how I do it and adapt them um, and, and under the guidance of a nutritionist, uh, preferably. Absolutely. So, well, thank you, first of all, for going into depth of that and then mentioning in the guidance of a nutritionist, because that's something that's valuable for all ranchers to have and need as a resource. So switching gears a little bit, you've talked a little bit about the impact of soil health with grazing corn stalks, but you, do you just want to kind of talk about that overall about how does grazing corn stalks impact the soil health? Yeah, so if you, um, you know, if you ask the agronomist um, how you should price grazing corn residue, often you will hear that you need to account for nutrients leaving with the cow. But I think the part that that we shouldn't expect the agronomist to understand is that that cow is at maintenance. By definition, maintenance is no gain or loss in body weight, right? That means that she's not removing any nitrate, nutrients from the field. Okay, so there's some, some carbon turnover, but if it's only 55% digestible, about half of what she's consuming ends up deposited back on the field. And quite frankly, in probably a better form, not probably, in a more useful form to the soil than the original corn residue was anyway. There's not much nitrogen. There's some nitrogen that's probably tied up um, in the residue itself. And then you're probably bringing in more uh, micro mineral and phosphorus through the supplement than what she's consuming anyway, or what she's what's leaving with her anyway. Okay, so that's the first thing to remember from a soil standpoint is cows at maintenance. She's not taking anything with her um, and from a nutrient standpoint. Um, in terms of carbon turnover for, for the soil itself, one of the advantages of having cows out on residue is the soil gets to take advantage of the microbes from the cow. Okay, so the feces that are deposited back out on the soil actually benefit the soil and benefit carbon turnover in the soil. I think we have data that to very clearly show that. Um, really no change in terms of organic matter content or soil organic carbon um, is the measurement that we would use. Um, and these are on fields that have been grazed for 20 years. Okay, so uh, corn soybean rotation, so they're grazed, every, the same field grazed every other year uh, for, for the past 20 years. Um, you know, the concern, the normal concern is that there is um, a loss in subsequent yield. Um, the other thing that you have to remember is that in high producing fields, this isn't every field, right? But if you're producing 200 or 250 bushel to the acre corn, there is a lot of residue left on that field. And 
farmers do stuff to, they do things to manage that residue, right? Um, I know I have a friend who goes in with a moldboard plow and, and turns it over about once a decade, right? Just to turn all that residue over. We don't really want to recommend that. Um, we'd much rather maintain long-term um, no-till farming practices. Well, some people go in with a shredder. Let the cow do the work for you. That's what I would say. In those high producing fields, let the cow do the work for you. She's probably only removing uh, somewhere between 15 and 20% of the biomass that's out there anyway. Um, so in our, in our long-term research studies, we've actually seen an improvement in subsequent soybean yield, two bushel to the acre. So again, I don't wanna, I don't wanna extrapolate that to, you're gonna see an improvement in yields regardless of your cropping system. But in a very normal corn soybean cropping system, we have a lot of data that, that suggests um, an improvement in subsequent soybean yield when you let the cow remove some of that residue. That's probably the biggest benefit from the producer standpoint, but there's some of these other soil health, especially on the microbial side, that's actually benefiting um, from having that cow out there. Well, awesome. Thank you for going through that more in depth. Um, but as we kind of round out this interview and conversation, just in summary, could you please explain, you know, the main points that producers need to be aware of when they're grazing corn stalks, just to kind of summarize everything. Yeah, the first uh, the first thing is remember the class of animal that you're that you're grazing. In our discussion today, you know we've been very specific about non-lactating, gestating a dry cow that's pregnant. Um, in a fall calving system that that you know you would potentially use on your ranch, Shay, um, you could have a, a lactating cow out on corn stalks, but then we would we would have a supplementation recommendation because she's going to need additional protein and energy for that lactation requirement. Um, and for rebreeding. Okay, so class of livestock. We didn't talk about the background of calf, but you can also utilize corn residue for, for weaned calves. Again, there would have to be some supplementation strategy associated um, with that. Um, second major point is the amount of residue that you have available to graze is driven by the corn yield. If you know corn yield, you know how much residue that you have out there and you can plan accordingly adjusting the number of animals that you want to have out there and shortening the number of days or less animals for longer days. You can do either of those two things. Um, we're, we're not really concerned about um, residual corn in most situations, downed corn. And so there's some specialized situations. If you have a windstorm or something where you have a lot of downed corn, but, but the old concerns about adapting cows to corn residue, if that field has been successfully harvested, there's really no concerns about that um, anymore. And then finally, um, we think there's more benefit to grazing corn residue in terms of both the environmental implications and soil health implications. Um, we, we just don't see any downside to that. And in fact, we think it's more of a be benefit than a hindrance. So um, tremendous resource. Um, I, think, I think we've got a lot left to learn in the integrated cropping livestock system. And as acres become more um, the supply of acres diminish some, which we expect to continue to happen. Um, we'll have to be more efficient at utilizing those acres for two purposes. Well, awesome. Thank you for being on the show today. Is there anything else you would like to add before we wrap up? Look forward to seeing you in class next week. <laughs> Are you experiencing a bit of a drought on your grazing lands? As mentioned earlier, my friend Jess at Red Summit Advisors understands how hard it can be on your operation during the dry years. She's helping many of your neighbors with PRF insurance, that's pasture, rangeland, and forage insurance. Jess can help you with this USDA program to protect your ranch when there isn't enough rain. Not every ranch is the same, so she looks at historical rainfall data in your area and focuses coverage on the driest months. So. You can be happy when it rains, covered when it doesn't, and make sure your family can stay on the land for generations to come. The deadline for 2022 coverage is December 1st, so give Jess a call at 801-360-6431 for an analysis on your place. To learn more, check out redsummit.com. That's red with two Ds, 
So that's R-E-D-D-S-U-M-M-I-T dot com. Or call Jess at 801-360-6431.